Hi, I'm Eric Lundin, editor of TPJ, the Tube and Pipe Journal. Welcome to the first episode of TPJ TV. In this series of webisodes, we're going to cover tube fabrication and production topics. For the first episode, our host company is Plymouth Tube Company in East Troy, Wisconsin. We're at the first stage of the tube manufacturing process, and here to describe it for us is Dan Janikowski. What we do to make a tube is we start out with very long, skinny coils of flat roll strip. We take the flat roll strip, form it through a series of rolls into the shape of a tube. We do an arc weld at the top of that, pass it through the welding mill, cold work that weld, and then we go through a series of forming rolls to make the final size. During that operation, we do a whole series of tests as well. We have an eddy current test, and we also do a lot of manipulation tests on samples to make sure that the product is made properly. How many forming steps would be typical? Well, it all depends on the design of the mill. It could be anywhere from about seven all the way up to 15 different forming steps. For stainless steel and other corrosion resistant materials, what are the different welding methods that you use? Most of the time we're using a tungsten inert gas, but we could also use other, uh, other methods such as plasma. For, uh, for example, one alloy that we specialize here in this plant is an alloy called Secure. It's predominantly TIG welded, cold worked, and then it will be heat treated in line on, on the welding. Can you tell us more about the forging operation? It, we have actually two different methods that work quite effectively at this plant. One is actually a, what we call a roller forging operation, where the roll at the top actually bounces up and down and does the forging. The second one is what's called a reciprocating roll down operation, and that reciprocating roll down, the roll will actually come across the top, roll like this, come across the top, roll like this, and then there's a mandrel in the center that supports the inside of the weld. Okay. Can you tell us some more detail about the manipulation tests? Manipulation tests are a series of tests that are described by ASME and ASTM that require that we do it on the final product. They are taking the tube and actually bending it inside out or flattening it or flanging it. And what we do is we do a whole series of those tests right on the welding mill as an in-process test in addition to the ones that are done on the final product. After welding and cold working, the next step is annealing. Yes, with stainless steels to get optimum corrosion resistance, we need to heat treat the, the stainless steel to make sure that we homogenize the weld. Each type of uh, stainless steel that we have requires a very, very special heat treatment. On some of them, we actually heat treat directly in line on a welding mill right behind the cold working operation. But over in this other operation, we use what's called a furnace annealer, which is a much longer time and temperature. It is typically used for our alloys such as AL6XM, which has a lot of nickel and molybdenum. How long do you hold the uh, material at temperature? In the furnace annealer, we are as long as eight minutes. When they, in the inline annealer with alloys like our superfluidic Secure, it's much, much shorter, typically on the order of 15 seconds. After the furnace annealer, what's the next step? Is it a quench? It's very, very important to make sure we don't slow cool stainless steels because you can form detrimental secondary phases. So what we do is we try to always water quench behind, behind that operation for these special alloys that we're making in this plant. The next steps are straightening and a pressure test. Uh, the conventional pressure test is a hydrostatic test, although at Plymouth they use an air underwater test. As far as the straightening, they actually use a bending operation to straighten the tube, and Dan's going to tell us more about both of these steps. Thank you. When we heat treat a tube, what ends up happening is the tube becomes crooked, and we have to straighten that tube uh, with some operation. Now, there's many different types of straightening operations. In this operation right here, we'll be showing you what's called a rotary straightening operation. In the rotary straightening operation, we're actually taking the tube, spinning the tube, and putting it through a series of cross rolls, which actually bends the tube up a little bit, bends the tube down a little bit. When you get done, you get a tube that's very, very straight. Following that test, what we do is we go into what's called the air underwater test. The more traditional test has been the hydrostatic test. But we've done a bunch of tests in, testing in ASTM, ASTM as round robin testing that shows the air underwater test is much, much more sensitive for little tiny holes than the hydrostatic test. So today the hydrostatic test is only required where the, where the specification asks for. The next step for the straight tube is inspection. So can you run us through the various inspection process? Okay, we actually do three different types of inspections here. We do a visual inspection, we do a dimensional inspection, and then we go into what's called the uh, electric, electrical test, 
which is a combination either eddy current, ultrasonic, or both of, and both of those. Okay. So with the visual inspection, what are you looking for? With the visual inspection, what we do is we put a light box at one end of the tube, and we look through every tube to make sure that the inside of the tube is sufficiently clean and pickled. We also roll the tubes to make sure that they're straight. We look at the outside to make sure that's, that's uh, uh, sufficiently clean, and then make sure there's no divots or scratches or anything like that. How about the dimensional inspection? We do a combination of a micrometer measurement on 10% of the tubes for each of the OD dimensions. We measure the wall thickness around on 10% of the tubes, and then we do something called ring gauging, where we run a ring over both ends of the tubes to see if there's any high spots, and that ring is set up at the top of the columns. How far down the length of the tube do you run the ring gauge? We normally do ring gauge full arm's length at this station. Unless the customer asks for more, we might do occasional full length. However, earlier in the process, we're full length and ring gauging as, as an internal process inspection. Now, the final uh, pair of tests were eddy current and ultrasonic. Right. Most of the testing that we do here is eddy current tests, but in some very critical applications, such as nuclear power plants, a customer will ask us to do an ultrasonic test as well. The eddy current test actually looks for little tiny uh, short defects. Well, the ultrasonic test is very sensitive for more longitudinal defects. So if you have the combination of all those tests combined with addition to the air and the water that we showed a little bit earlier, then you have really the ultimate test tube for a nuclear power plant for high reliability. We're at the last stage of production for feed water heater tubing at Plymouth Tube. This is where the U-bending is done on links that are up to 150 feet in length. After the uh, tube is bent into a U-shape, it's then uh, annealed. Um, and then prepared for shipping. The reason why we do that uh, is because when, a, when certain type of heat exchangers, if they get very, very hot and very, very cold, there's a lot of expansion that occurs. And when that expansion occurs, the tube itself will grow up to several inches long, and you have to be able to accommodate. So what we do here is we actually bend the tube in the shape of a U. The tube is only held at one end, and as the tube heats up, it expands, and then as it cools down, it contracts. During the operation here, not only do we bend it, but we then heat treat the new bend area to relieve residual stresses and then do a hydro test operation after that. The tube is fi finally has a, a, a final cut on it and then it's ready to be boxed to go directly into the heat exchange. The one question we haven't asked yet, and it's a question that comes up over and over again, is what is the difference between tube and pipe? Eric, that's a very good question. I get asked that question all the time. A uh, pipe is predominantly used for long runs where you're going to convey a fluid from one place to another. Tube is generally used in either heat exchanger applications where it's got to fit inside a hole or for mechanical applications. Therefore, they have a tendency to have different dimensions. And the way that it's easiest for me to explain it to some people is if, uh, when you buy a tube, you actually buy the tube to the outside dimension. When you buy a pipe, you actually get what's in the inside of the hole. So a one inch pipe typically has a one inch hole and outside uh, a one inch tube has typically the outside dimension is one inch. Easiest way I look at it is that if you buy a pipe you buy the hole in the center, if you buy the tube you buy the metal. That's a good way to put it. Founded in 1924, Plymouth Tube Company now has 13 facilities in the U.S. I'd like to introduce Dean Hoffman, general manager of the company's Trent facility. Hello. Yeah, we are on our fifth generation family owned. We produce precision steel tubing, carbon alloy tubing, near net shape and cold drawn uh, in stainless and titanium in our facilities. Each of the facilities within Plymouth Tube is an entity in and of itself. We are very focused on customers and markets and, and satisfying their needs in tubing. Now give me a sense of how many markets you're involved in. Our markets vary from nuclear, power generation, aerospace, mechanical needs, etc. Uh, it's probably more than 13 or 14 markets that we bring solutions to. Do you get a lot of synergy among the different uh, uh, companies? Yes, we do. In fact, it is not unusual for one or two of our mill-specific teams to deal with a customer or an industry based on their needs in, in either size range or alloys. On behalf of the Tube & Pipe Journal magazine, I'd like to thank Plymouth Tube and Dean Hoffman for taking some time with us today. You can see future episodes at the Media Center at www.thefabricator.com.